So I say this and I'll come back to these, these, these facts, these statements about who I am at the end, just to think about how who we are shapes the work we do in our interpretation of this work and how it can be a means of providing insight into a deeper understanding of the health phenomena we're looking at. So just to lay some groundwork, I remind folks that being an immigrant, being undocumented doesn't make you sick, right? No, so, no more so that being Latino or being black or being a woman or being queer makes you sick. It's the surveillance, detention and deportation or how the country treats you based on this identity or based on this status that makes you sick. We think back to our quantitative work, right? That measure of race that predicts poor health is not because race predicts poor health, but because race is a proxy measure for racism, right? When race is predicting poor health, it's because of the system of racism in which it exists. As public health education and nursing professionals, our job is to distribute resources equally, not to judge who's worthy and not worthy, but to make sure everyone gets the healthcare to which they're entitled. I remind folks that everyone is linked to someone of all immigration statuses. I usually don't have to say that in these types of crowds because there's lots of folks who themselves have visas or perhaps may be undocumented, right? But in many other crowds, people forget that undocumented folks and folks with visas are our neighbors in our schools, go to school with our children, uh, our parents and cousins, uh, aunts and uncles, perhaps sometimes professors. And that even those who don't know anybody who is undocumented, those who are totally outside of these networks, are still benefiting from labor exploitation of immigrant population. So we're all linked, whether personally or economically, to this community. And then I remind folks, no matter where you are in the immigrant rights movement, there's always somewhere to start, right? And I generally, you know, I call it and think about it as the immigrant rights movement. You're clearly health providers. I'm a public health professional. So we also think of it in terms of health. Um, but as I'll show you when we're thinking about these large systems, often it is part of what we do in our clinical interactions, but it's also part of a larger struggle uh, for, for health equity with marginalized communities. So let's think a little bit about deportation in the US. There's an easy and obvious takeaway from this graph, right? And that's that deportations were climbing and are climbing. Uh, you see 1996, there were some law changes. And then in 2001, again, uh, laws changes, uh, 2001 marked 9-11, um, um, resulting in this steep increase in the number of deportations from the US peaking in about 400,000 uh, under President Obama. This means a couple of things. One, again, the immediate takeaway is that's a lot of deportations. That's a lot of people removed. And we as health providers know that in order to be happy and healthy, you can't just have people plucked out of your social support network, right? This is totally antithetical to what we know about health. We know that every single one of those dots on that line means not only that that person's health was impacted, but everyone's health connected to them was impacted. And that's what I want you to think about here through the rest of this presentation. Who is captured on this graph of deportations, but who do we miss, right? So we understand the scale is who's removed, but what about the health of the people who are left behind? How does deportation or the threat of deportation impact them? So I'll tell you about three pathways today and then give a little bit of an example from the work that I do. The one that's most obvious is that actual detention and deportation, actually being removed and physically held in a cage before being placed in a plane and returned to another country, it's not really good for your health. The second is that the threat of deportation leads to physiological changes. When we're worried about this removal and surveillance, as you all well know, stress can make its way into your body. But the other reaction to the threat of deportation is behavior changes, right? Where we largely focus in public health and you often focus in nursing, we just do different things when we're scared about being removed or surveilled. So let's look at these a little more closely. As I mentioned, the first pathway is pretty easy to wrap our heads around, right? Being detained, being deported is not meant to be healthy, right? Nowhere, um, detention, jail, and prison are meant to house large numbers of people in as close a space as possible to be overseen by as few staff as possible. 
this is why we saw this being such a disaster during the pandemic. These are not spaces made for health, right? Detention centers are known spaces of human rights violations. Every time someone's in detention or prison or jail, they're removed from their social support network. And for those who were fleeing violence in their home countries, they may also be, uh, excuse me, returned to that violence in their home countries. For those connected to them, we know that sometimes the removal, especially when this person is the pr primary financial provider can lead to what we call acute poverty and what sociologist Joanna Drebbe calls suddenly single mothers. Just given the extremely gendered nature of deportation, what often happens is that men are detained and removed. This often leaves mothers or their wives behind, their spouses behind, who suddenly go from a two-parent family to a one-person family, not only with one less income, but with many, many more charges to pay, many, many more costs to pay, right? So simple detention and bond um, and uh, things like phone calls and traveling to visit, right? And attorneys, so all these other costs related to detention when the primary breadwinner is gone, Ultimately, this can lead to the dissolution of the family or at a minimum, a rearrangement of the family when the person is no longer present in the US or is held in jail or prison or detention. So if we know that detention and deportation can impact our health, uh, we do things about it, right? One of those things we do is we worry about it. And we try to prevent it. How do we try to prevent it? We're just really hypervigilant for anything that could make it happen. We worry about the police that could remove us from our families, right? And these physiological changes, this alertness can become acute or rather can be acute, like when you're stopped by an officer in a traffic stop, activating your fight or flight system, or it become, can become chronic. For example, you can worry that if I turn down that street that I was on last time when I got pulled over, I may see an officer, even if no officer's present, you worry about the possibility. And this frequent activation creates wear and tear in the body. And we know that this wear and tear can result in other health repercussions like hypertension, sleep difficulties and weight changes, and is especially critical during pregnancy. So when we're worried about being surveilled and removed, the other way to avoid this is to change the things we do, right? To change our behaviors. The best way, right? Or I, I should say the, the uh, most efficient way to reduce the odds of encountering someone who may detain us is simply to confine oneself to one's home. And this is what we see after acute instances of immigration enforcement, such as immigration raids, which I'll talk to you about next. Folks just stay home. We stay, hear stories of them shuttering the blinds and locking the doors. Children don't go to school. Um, and with this confinement to one's home often can come an avoidance of social services, avoiding our clinics, avoiding the places we go to maintain our health, but also avoiding people and areas, right? So if you know that enforcement happened in this area, in this town, in this neighborhood, or even at this intersection, you tend to avoid that intersection. What happens if that intersection is where your aunt and your uncle live or where your clinic is? So just avoid those spaces as well, right? And I like to emphasize that these may be health decisions. These may even be, we may categorize these as poor health decisions, right? Not seeing your doctor. Uh, but ultimately, these are, these are for self-preservation. And the families I've spoken with, it's, it's much more, um, it's better for your health. It's more logical to avoid one doctor's appointment than it is to risk the possible removal from your family, from your country. So, so I just wanna recap before I move on to the next, uh, next piece. Uh, again, three pathways, right? So actual detention and deportation. We know how catastrophic that can be. So we're vigilant about it which can create all sorts of health problems from constant hypervigilance. And we also change our behaviors and we avoid the people and the places that keep us healthy. Again, wanna emphasize that we know as health professionals that in order to be healthy, you have to see other people in your family and in your community. And you have to go to the places in which you receive your health services. If you can't do this, it doesn't matter how close your relationship is with your family or how good or culturally sensitive your medical facility is, you're not leaving your home, you're not able to access those healthcare uh, services. 
I talk about this thus far as if it's race neutral. I don't hit this heavy in this particular uh, lecture, though I do have an entire class about this. So I invite you to listen to this, uh, what I'm taught this, this topic for another uh, 14 weeks if you're interested in my class in the winter. Um, but there's a heavy role of race and class and immigration enforcement. The artist who drew this took this from a story that we saw in Bean Station when a raid was conducted in the meatpacking plant in Tennessee. During this raid in which 98 people were detained, ICE corrals all of the Latino or otherwise dark-skinned folks to the middle of the room asking for papers while the white and lighter-skinned uh, workers were allowed to go out and have a cigarette break. Racial profiling is often a fundamental part of immigration enforcement. And obviously people from communities, people on the ground know this, right? They know that if you're darker skinned or if you look a particular way, you're more likely to be pulled over. So we see a differential in who is actually locking themselves in their homes and who is actually avoiding these spaces, right? Fear of being racially profiled is a big part of this. And this, I'll skip to point three here because race often intersects with class, especially in immigration enforcement. What ICE agents do is look for someone who, and there's air quotes all over the place here, right? Looks undocumented. And how does someone look undocumented, right? Well, to ICE, this means doing the type of labor that undocumented folks do, which in Michigan often includes landscaping and other places includes things like roofing, hotel cleaning, uh, and painting, right? often manual labor jobs. What are the signs of looking undocumented? Again, air quotes. What we see in our community is things like having a truck with mowers and ladders for paints, right? We see this intersection, looking at race and looking for class. And skipping to point two, politicians are often allowed to uh, deny that any of this has anything to do with race because they can just say it was attributed to immigration status. Even if everyone on all the ice buses driving out of the factory are all uniformly the same brown color skin, politicians can say, well, of course we're looking, this is all based on immigration status, not on skin color. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the work that I do and just give you an example from a case uh, about, from a case that'll, that'll kind of, you know, illustrate these three pathways I've described. I keep wanting to apologize for drinking coffee, but I think it was called Coffee and Conversation, right? So I feel like this, this is part of it. So my work on immigration home raids specifically uh, the first iteration and, and the book uh, that I that I wrote that you can see here is about an immigration home raid that happens in in on Thursday in November in 2013, uh, about seven miles from where you are sitting right now at the School of Nursing. Right, so this is our neighborhood. This is right where we live. These are people who we probably cross paths with all the time. Um, this raid, like many others. Uh, so most raids, this one occurred in the afternoon, which I'll describe shortly, but most immigration home raids, we know from testimonies in court, occur in pre-dawn hours, agents are wearing body armor. You can read other details about this. The point being that these are often heavily militarized. As you can see in the next picture, this isn't the raid I studied, but this is a general immigration or rather police raid. Um, these are heavily militarized. As I like to remind folks, People aren't leaving their country in which they've established a home and a family because they're asked nicely. They're leaving specifically under the threat of violence, right? You're leaving, you're, you're being detained because you know that the alternative could be being killed, right? Like it's very easy for folks to miss this. Um, but what do you think it would be like to be on the other side of this door during an event like this? Um, so to tell you a little bit about the event, and then I'll go into one particular case from the event. So this happened on a Thursday in November in 2013. It was described, you know, just a day like any other. One of the worst, most toxic parts of these events is that they do happen on days like any other, right? They're just your normal everyday average day that therefore can, that thereafter turns catastrophic. And on this particular day, a week before rather, ICE had conducted a stakeout on, at, at a taller, a taller is the Spanish word for automobile shop, um, with an apartment that was above the automobile shop. And I say apartment and taller loosely, it was actually kind of a warehouse that the space was used in this particular way. 
um, the apartment was, was really just warehouse space used as living space. But during this stakeout, ICE was looking at or surveilling an individual who they deported at least once before and when he was previously deported, was reported to have guns uh, and drugs. So they see him in his taller going back and forth to the car, um, talking to the people in the car and they're driving away, which I would argue is kind of a fundamental part of owning a mechanic shop and the ICE, ICE interpreted a bit differently. ICE uh, collaborated with the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office to conduct this raid. Um, so the Sheriff's Office brought the SWAT team and the SWAT team uh, starts the arrest, this, rather the local police uh, start the arrests at about, uh, I think it was seven in the morning, arresting Santiago, a pseudonym, but the target of the raid and all the other Latino men who are driving out of this property. They do this multiple times throughout the day and the facility is ultimately raided about 6.30 p.m. SWAT goes in first and removes all the Latino men, leaves behind about four women and about five children under the age of five. After SWAT leaves, ICE, I think I may have mentioned this out of order, ICE goes in for, excuse me, SWAT goes in first, ICE goes in after and removes the Latino men. Um, so what we see is actually an event that's fairly typical um, of what was going on at that time, right? A highly gendered immigration enforcement in which men are targeted and men are removed. And even though there was one single target who was arrested at seven in the morning, all these other Latino undocumented men were swept up. Um, this changes the community's relationship, as you can imagine, to that facility and to all the space around it as they worry about racial profiling. But what I wanna go into next and what I wanna push you to think about, there was one individual who was targeted, there was about six individuals who were deported, right? So we think of those six individuals and all six of them are represented somewhere in that climbing graph uh, of deportations. So we think about their health, we think about their health as they're detained and removed from their networks, right? But now let's look a little more closely at the people who are not on that graph, who are not connected to them and who may not even be undocumented whose health was impacted by this enforcement. Now, I'll, I'll start by saying that this was um, you know, a good chunk of years ago. Uh, I was a PhD student at the time, younger, um, engaged in a, a pretty in-depth and, and traumatic study, right? I spoke to all the folks who were involved in this raid and who were in the facility when it was raided. Um, I was kind of balancing, right, being, balancing being a, a public health professional and wanting to ask and understand these public health concepts um, while talking to somebody that was experienced something truly traumatic, right? That fundamentally shaped not only like literal like logistics of her life, where she worked, where she went, what she did, uh, but also just emotionally, right? Understandably. And so this is the, the woman I'll, I'll, I'll discuss next. Her name, her pseudonym is, is Guadalupe. Guadalupe is a bit younger than me had three children at the time, was in the facility with two of those children when it was raided. And I begin by, we were sitting on her couch and I asked her about the patrullas and patrullas is the word you see uh, italicized there at the, at the first sentence, patrullas means patrol cars. Um, it's really notable because in Spanish, this word patrulla is used a lot. We don't really say it in English. Like we don't say the patrol cars were nearby. We may say the police were nearby. But the patrulla means either ICE or police, it doesn't really matter. It just means that vehicle in which I'll be placed to be taken away from the people I know and love, right? So there's this heavy emphasis on the place, the thing that transports me out of my life, right? In a way we don't have in English. So I begin by asking Guadalupe about the patrullas. You were talking about how frightened you were from las patrullas. Do you feel the same fear when you, for example, go to a clinic or a government office or something like that? Again, a very typical public health question. I wanna know if her fear of the police extends to her fear of clinics. She tells me no and I ask her why not? And Guadalupe responds, I don't know. Maybe it's because in clinics and such I have received help before the raid. In my mind, it's the police. The police are the ones who took away the father of my daughters, the ones who took away my brother. They are the ones who took away my family who if they detained me or separate me from my kids. So we kind of pause on her couch. I process what she's saying. I could kind of begin to tell that she may have never 
thought about this out loud and described it so linearly. And I can start to feel that she's also thinking about what she's going to say. And it's starting to feel like the end of the conversation, like I've gotten my question answered, right? Now, as a researcher, and again, a young public health professional, these were important findings. One was certainly that oh, the police are not the people who keep me safe. The police are the people who separate me from my family. And this is a critical public health finding. And the other is that people may fear clinics, may fear services after immigration enforcement, but perhaps not if they have good relationships with those, those clinics and services. Maybe that's the finding, right? This is what I was, was going through my head. Maybe that's the finding. Maybe we need to have strong relationships and this is what will matter ultimately after immigration enforcement. But we both pause, we both take a breath and then Guadalupe carries on and kind of refines her answer a little bit. And you know, so I asked her about the services specifically in Washtenaw County. And she says, yes, I have the Washtenaw Health Plan. And you know, I wanna confirm, maybe this is because she had a good relationship with that Washtenaw Health Plan. So you had this before the raid too, I ask her. She says, yes, I had it before the raid. And again, I confirm. So after the raid, you use the same services as before. And she said, yes, I asked when I went to renew my health plan because of the raid, if there would be any problems because ICE, they had my name and all that, but the health plan told me, no, I shouldn't worry, nothing will happen. And I asked her to confirm, okay, so you have confidence in the person who discussed this with you? She said, well, yes, because I thought they know more about this than I do. She told me that all information was confidential and that if I wanted anyone to know something, I had to sign first to authorize it. So again, an important finding, right? I'm sitting here with Guadalupe on her couch. Her kids are usually running around uh, in the room. Sometimes my kids were around and they would be playing together. And at this point, you know, she's, she's kind of told me, they're like, yeah, I was scared of the police. I'll always be scared of the police because now they represent deportation, but I still use some services because I trusted them before the event, right? An important finding, maybe the issue is that no new services will be used by Guadalupe, but she still uses the old ones. Again, we rest, we take a breath, and then she keeps going, right? And then she continues and she says, the truth is that in that moment, when they told me that my name would remain confidential, I thought it was a lie and I was scared. I had the address of a friend who was a white US citizen and I used that address so that my bills could go there. I didn't want to give my address where I was, nothing. So I confirmed with her. So immediately after the raid, you didn't want to share your address, not with the Washtenaw Health Plan, not with anyone. And she ends by saying, no, nothing like that. I wanted to share this information with no one, including food stamps for the kids. I didn't want to renew anything because I was so scared of everything. So this is the kind of the point where the conversation ends. And this is the kind of point where Guadalupe really uh, threw me for a loop, kind of changed my understanding of what was going on and, and the depth at which immigration enforcement can impact all of the public health structures we create and all of the literature we've written about, how important it is to be culturally sensitive and, and bilingual. And here Guadalupe started by saying, yeah, those things matter and ended by saying like, nah, none of that mattered. I was just too scared. Okay. Now this really pushed me as a healthcare provider and public health professional to think about the importance, not only of being attuned to culture and attuned to language, but also of working outside of my immediate healthcare system to work on the immigration system that ultimately shapes everything I did in the other system anyway. All right, so just to summarize and then switch over to questions, again, three pathways that I hope you think about, encourage you to think about both in our own work in the US, but globally, actual detention and deportation was not made to keep people healthy, right? That was not the intention. It's obviously a way that people get harmed. When we're worried about this removal and surveillance, our, our physiology changes, which can lead to health outcomes and our behavior changes, which limits our interaction with the people and places we need to stay healthy. I end by reminding us that there's a role for each one of us. Again, it was important to have culturally and language appropriate services, but ultimately we also need to think about the system and political context in which that exists. For many of us in Michigan, driver's licenses are still not accessible to undocumented folks. 
There's a movement to make this so, and it's an important part of the advocacy. It simply reduces being able to racially profile poor folks over and put them in jail. Uh, skipping down to number three, local police collaboration with ICE is critical, specifically sheriff's offices. The sheriff is the one who, op who, who um, decides whether or not he will collaborate with ICE and the sheriff is an elected position. So it's very important to know the sheriff's policy on ICE. Psych uh, number four, as you're doing here, continue to educate yourself about immigration enforcement and change the narrative when you're having these discussions with other people. Immigration enforcement is not simply about being undocumented, right? It's, it's, it's about all the folks connected to the people with this particular legal status and the way we as a community cannot maintain our health when members of our community are, particularly, are, are perpetually targeted for removal. So thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to keep this conversation going here uh, as well as email or Twitter. Uh, and for those of you who uh, read separated, I'm always happy to engage. If you're a professor and your students read the book, I'm also happy to join classes. So thanks so much for listening and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Monroe Kramer and take a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez. Um, I just wanna point out, um, Preet uh, shared a document in the uh, chat as well. Um, that gives a link to the book as well as some of the other concepts and um, readings that Dr. Lopez was discussing during his talk. It looks like Jennifer wants to start us off with a question. Do you want to go ahead and unmute, Jennifer? Yeah. Sure. Was, Hi, Jennifer. Hey, great presentation. I was just wondering which courses you teach at U of M and when they're offered. <laughs> Sure, I teach a good handful of many, many courses in many, many platforms, uh, including Coursera, Canvas, Residential. I say that so you can email my chair and remind her that Dr. Lopez teaches a bunch of classes, you should promote him though. Uh, but I teach, um, I do, I teach a good chunk of classes, but the one that's related to this particular topic is uh, law enforcement, health impacts of law enforcement in the US. And I'll, I'll share the syllabus with you and it's in the winter. Yeah, the, the pandemic really forced um, lots of us to teach in a range of ways. And just, you know, since I'm clinical and do a lot of teaching, it did mean I ended up teaching six, 14 on all the different platforms, six week, 14 weeks on all the different platforms. Um, I'm going off topic. In this particular class, I think, so the mechanisms you saw, I relate to both police and immigration enforcement. There's actually not, um, much of a difference, right, between the way folks are worried and about police limit their use of services for the very same reasons. Uh, and we also have these types of these statuses that mark individuals in our communities, whether it's being undocumented or having a felony status, right? These are ways that law enforcement can ultimately target one person who's attached to a lot of people um, and not actually remove them, though that is sometimes the goal, sometimes the goal is to put them in jail, but much more control actually comes from the possibility of removing people, right? So this perpetual surveillance is actually much more useful tool of control for law enforcement than is the actual removal of people. That's a long-winded answer to your question, but this class is in the winter and I, uh, public health, social work students, and I don't think I've had a student from the School of Nursing though I'd love to. Hi, Megan. Oh, Bill, so can you talk a little bit um, about the sort of downstream impact um, on families of this in terms of trust in law enforcement, um, you know, in cases later, you know, where there might be domestic violence, where there might be um, an issue with a child, um, just... Sure. Yeah, and, and you know, I think I think Guadalupe's quote really, really stuck with me. Like the police are the people who, uh, I think she said, take my children away. And the police are the ones who took away the father of my daughters, the ones who took away my brother. So Guadalupe, while she was pregnant with her son in the car, she was pulled over and the father of her daughter was deported. Then later on, she was in this raid and the father and, and her um, her brother was deported, right? So, what, what I part of the challenge in, in documenting this this book, which 
and which which is a good amount of time right so the field work was a year but it was also you know probably a year on each side in which I just engaged in the work so like you know a three-year period but I still really only touched on on I made this by the nature of writing this kind of piece and probably in writing in general and looking at a period of time you kind of don't realize just how chronic this is, right? So like throughout the course of knowing Guadalupe, other people who have been deported from her life, it's just a constant stream of removal, like all the time. And it's 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 hard to really relay that. Um, and this going back to your question, right? The, the police are a fundamental way in which people are put into the immigration system. So this idea that we would we would trust the police um, is it, simply antithetical to the idea that we have that people want to remain healthy, right? It's just simply not healthy to trust the people who might take you away. Um, what does this have? What effect does this have downstream? Certainly, no one's going to call the police in, in instances of, of domestic violence. Um, part of the challenge in these particular cases, in those cases specifically, is that folks may not actually want their financial provider deported they just way want a response to domestic violence, right? Um, the actual removal of the often father or husband or spouse from the person's lives may not be the end goal. It, it might be, right? I'm not speaking on all cases of domestic violence, certainly, um, but it may not be the goal. So the implications end up being enormous. Um, the other thing I often like to emphasize is that we tend to think that we avoid calling police when we are undocumented or we know that someone we love is undocumented or, or even don't love them, I, I use that phrase too often, someone in our network is undocumented, but often we don't know people's statuses and we might just guess, right? So if there's, if there's 10 people in my house and I know that some of them are engaged in manual labor and I know that he was paid in cash, that may just be part of my network. It may also mean they're undocumented, I don't know, but I'm, I'm just probably not going to call the police because of the possibility that someone may be removed. Right, so often it is because we know status, but often it's just because we're taking a logical guess. So this this means not only that people in our immediate family, but we may not want the police in the neighborhood. We may not want the police nearby. Um, so it has lots of implications for our, our trust in, in these systems. It also the last thing I'll say because we're also working on a, a non police unarmed response in Ann Arbor. Not many of these are happening throughout the country, so it'd be great if we had one in Ann Arbor. Uh, but the police are not often needed in all of these situations, right? Uh, we, we see folks who have car accidents who would rather flee than call 911 because even if they ask for an ambulance, they fear that the police will come, right? Like police simply aren't needed in all emergency situations. Thanks, Megan. That was a, that was a great question. I see one, one in the chat, I believe. Oh, no, um, I wonder how immigration enforcement provides mental health management for people with psychological issues after being detained. I, I don't even know where to begin with that, right? Right in time, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I, again, like to remind folks that the putting people into a cage is antithetical to keeping them healthy. So the goal is not to keep them healthy. They may provide some services, but that's, that's, that's not the goal. Um, the other you know, extreme challenge with deportation in a way that's very different from working in the prison system is that the goal of detention is to get people out of detention. It's not to keep them there, right? So um, whereas we make lots of money exploiting prisoner labor, we don't make money exploiting undocumented detained labor. We make lots more money exploiting them, undocumented folks when they were not detained, detaining them and then removing them as quickly as possible and having more people come in to work and exploit, right? So what this means is that the detention is actually, it's incentivized, whereas prison is incentivized to keep folks as long as possible from a profit perspective, detention is incentivized to remove them as fast as possible. So there, there's virtually no way to provide any type of consistent healthcare in these settings, right? And that's before we even think about language barriers, cultural barriers, or anything else. They're, the folks just aren't in detention very long, right? Um, a good thing because we don't want people detained, but a bad thing uh, because ultimately it means that they're being removed. Um, because you know you're bringing up mental health here, one of the things that is also extremely challenging is is treating mental health when you are the cause of the mental health problem. So when we live in a society that in which billions of dollars is spent on our surveil surveillance and removal, and then we're detained. 
and our trauma and illness is coming from being surveilled and removed, it's a little hard for the counselors who are funded and supported by DHS and ICE to ask, what are the impacts of immigration enforcement while they're kind of part of that system, right? So they may go back to things like depression or anxiety or PTSD, but as soon as it becomes linked to the cultural and political system, it becomes hard to provide counseling for, right, for, for obvious reasons. So um, I think it's, it's one challenge after another, in addition to it not being the goal of providing mental health care in these settings. Um, Dr. Lopez, I have a, a question. So sure. I'm thinking about like preventive care and um, obviously individuals are, are reluctant to seek that care if they don't trust the health system. Um, and so during COVID, I, I work at the Washtenaw County Health Department. And then I noticed there were some attempts to engage um, with different communities uh, to ensure back COVID vaccination. And I feel that these occurred a little later, but eventually did occur. And so there were kind of like drive-through clinics um, and then clinics at churches and community centers um, with interpreters and kind of cultural brokers to try to reach different populations. And it seemed, you know, from my viewpoint as someone that was just giving shots um, to, to, to reach a lot of the community. Yeah. I mean, we had cars driving in with like seven people. It was great to get everyone vaccinated. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, you know, what else we can do that's a bit more long-term to establish trust with um, communities that rightfully so might have some, um, some fear um, in yeah. seeking kind of preventative health care and, and vaccinations. Oh, what a great question. I did not even, I did not even ask Dr. Monroe Kramer to ask this question. That's a good one. And I have 10 answers for. This also illustrates why it's so hard to teach uh, in a Zoom setting, because I just want to get up and hop around. And I would definitely be in the front of the room bouncing around to answer this question. Um, and so Guadalupe, who, who you saw, right, describing her fear of police to me, um, so I'll go back to Dr. Monroe Kramer's question, right? And, and I wanna think about the vaccines that happened in Washtenaw County, right? And those happened at, at St. Francis Church uh, among other places. And I don't know if Michelle, that's where you gave the vaccinations. Yeah. It is, um, I saw you there. <laughs> okay, great, yeah. And my, so it was, and you're absolutely right. It reached a large portion of the population for one very obvious, silly reason there's a lot of parking at St. Francis and like when you're scared of the police you want to go to places where there's parking it sounds really stupid but like one of the most influential things I've seen about healthcare access is just parking it's it's crazy it's wild excuse me but um so you know while my partner also volunteered at the clinic giving uh translating or doing paperwork to, so that folks could could get their COVID vaccines and she walks in and, and next to her, translating with her, doing peer work with her was, was Guadalupe, right? So Guadalupe was also in this clinic, also helping members of her community get the COVID vaccine. And I love this story because I love pointing out that like it, in our limited narratives of you know, studying one particular health um, phenomena, inevitably, and it's unfortunate, but someone is, is cast as, the victim might be a harsh word, right? But certainly, uh, Guadalupe was the target of this enforcement and impacted by this enforcement and doesn't tell the full story of how she's also an advocate in her community and also going out and creating other systems and helping people get vaccinated, right? And part of what we did or part of what organizers from Washington County did was create a system in which these people who are largely disenfranchised in one setting can be empowered in another setting, in a setting that isn't asking about documentation status and in which skills like translation are one of the most sought after talents or abilities, right? So it was great to have that type of outreach um, and, and was completely successful. What I like to bring up also when this point is brought up is that, yeah, we know these systems are successful, right? These working in churches, working with cultural brokers as you described them, um, but they also are largely sustained by grit and determination and perseverance and not funding, right? So if we know these places work to vaccinate large portions of our population, then the funding should also be funneled in this direction. And it shouldn't just be driven off the will and the, of, of people like Guadalupe who want to go back in their community and make a difference. It should also be their jobs, just like it is for many of us, right? Um, 
So Michelle's original question is, is how do we build trust in communities with valid reasons not to trust some parts of the government? And I always like this question because I always wrestle with it, like how to trust the system, part of the government in which billions of dollars and political and entire political parties are dedicated to your removal, right? And I like bringing this up because I want people to really wrestle with it. Like the entire election was about how hard the president was going to work to remove these people. And now we're asking them to trust us, right? I mean, it's kind of logical that they wouldn't, right? So how do we build the trust? Like, I think on the one hand, we do know many ways, you know, we go into the community, we, we speak or hire folks who speak the language, we engage in culturally sensitive practices. These are all good practices, right? At the same time, there's a larger political system that is antithetical to the work that we're doing that we need to work against also to validate the work that we're doing on the smaller level, right? And, and I say this knowing that it makes me and others extremely uncomfortable. Right. I had to wrestle with it a lot. Like what I'm doing on the small level sometimes might not be enough. And I, I guess that's the way it is. And either I keep doing what I'm doing um, that usually and generally works. And I think that's great. And we should do it. Um, but also, is there something else that we need to be doing? And I think it's OK as health practitioners to wrestle with that. Like, do I need to do more? And, and what is it in this particular political system? Uh, there's one question, and then I see Gupreet uh, also raised their hand. What are some responses from the community that have been helpful? Um, yeah, so uh, Megan, I think thinking about the COVID vaccine, the organizing was was fantastic around that. Um, I think the the different types of of ways of communication, different spaces, spaces that required people to go to places that they would otherwise go to anyway or already trusted. Right, one way to work with communities, especially if they as uh, lots of health needs or big families or um, jobs that are particularly demanding and have certain working hours, uh, extend the schedule and often have lots of needs met at the same time. So like we'll vaccinate you and all your kids and do your kids need school supplies because we have extra backpacks too, right? That type of thing tends to work very good for communities with lots of needs. Um, there was another question. Uh, Someone raised their hand, but it looks like the hand is down. No, I think um, Preet's hand is still up. Oh, great, sure. Preet's hand. Dr. Lopez, thank you so much for this great presentation. Something that I'm very interested in on, on a personal level, um, and I, I, I'd like your perspective on in this situation, um, is the, um, the psychological, the, the mental health, and the social issues that um, the generation of these children to come will face. Um, because um, from a personal perspective, my, my parents were um, child refugees over 70 years ago, but I know the way that I've been raised in a very privileged way, but I still have, I've been raised in a way that their experiences have, has impacted my life. I know it. Mm -hmm. Um, because children do not forget. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and um, the, the fact of, of what, what these children will be dealing with and, and their children to come. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a great question, Gupreet, which also sets me up for another happy story. So, um, you know, one of the men detained driving away from the raid, uh, his pseudonym, we, I call him Arturo in the book, um, he was detained and, and detained, I, I forget how long, you know, something like three months and, and his wife uh, tried to keep the family together. They had two kids uh, about the age, a little older than, than my oldest. So he was probably about 12 at the time. Um, and he, you know, so had to, had to deal with his, his, his dad's detention and then his dad's need to, you know, go back to court. Uh, and I, I talked about the hypervigilance of wondering if, if you would be detained, but there's this other layer, especially for kids, you know, kind of as you alluded to, of this perpetual worry of my parents be detained, or in this case, will my dad be deported, right? It was a constant worry. Um, his, dad, his dad wasn't deported. His dad is very successfully employed, but he was accepted to about seven universities and we're going to his open house later this week. So we're very, you know, there's, there's these stories of, of trauma and, and the very legitimate, but there's also, you know, surviving and thriving amid, amidst this. 
and he talks about about what his his father went through and and how much it you know kind of shaped his life and i think it it brought him an understanding of the system that i wouldn't wish on any child but is legitimately a deep understanding of the system that i think will go on um he'll go on to kind of do something about the immigration system um but you know your question uh, how does it impact the next generation I think on the one hand, it, it will remain to be seen. I think on the other hand, I, I imagine a, a deep distrust for a, a government that that harmed them. And I imagine a deep distrust for police. Um, but I, I couldn't really say. I work a little bit less with, with children, so I, I don't know the long-term uh, repercussions or, or how it will shape their, their lives. I wish I could give you a better answer. So in route to that, I will tell you two ways that aren't an answer to your question, but are still the ways that we know the next generation is impacted. Uh, for one, we did see uh, Dr. Novak, who was an EPID student and now professor uh, or a clinical researcher, did a study about the Postco Iowa raid. And so this happened in 2008, 398 people detained, right? So massive raid. And she looked at birth weight before and after the raid for Latino and white, uh, white infants. And Latino, or in the, in the study, it's infants born to Latino mothers, Latino infants, uh, were more likely to have low birth weight than their white uh, peers born at the same time, right? So we do see this enforcement literally making its way into the, into the biology, into the physiology of the next generation uh, via their, at this time, pregnant mothers. Um, and the other thing we see, the, the raid in, in Bean Station, which I referred to once, uh, but that happened in the middle of state testing in Tennessee. And then the raid in Mississippi. So during Trump conducted multiple raids in 2018. And then there was a couple in 2019, including a, uh, seven locations across Mississippi, the first day of public school, right? The first day of school. Um, so on the one, uh, first I get extremely angry that like two government organizations couldn't communicate and like ICE couldn't look at the academic calendar. like. It, it seems like a ridiculous request, but why would you do this on the first day of school? Um, but the second is, is what we see is that lots of those kids didn't, you know, don't go to school. The rate of absenteeism is extremely high, but it's only high among a portion of the population, right? So it's only high among Latino kids. And we see this universally, or I say universally, but nationally after these events, the ones who are often picking up the pieces are teachers who obviously aren't trained for this, right? And may come from heavily, uh, Republican districts in which this is not, they're not receiving a lot of public support to do this type of work. Um, and I say this, that this is two real ways that, right, these are making its way into people who aren't the targets or even experiencing these raids. One, in, in infants, the likelihood of, of increasing odds of low birth weight. And the second is students. They're not going to school. They're not doing their work. And, and to say, that in, you know, the sounds insignificant, like they're not able to focus on their schoolwork uh, for obvious reasons, right? And this is only a particular portion of these students, right? And, you know, this is this is the point where, you know, in my class and, and in other places, I kind of suggest that if there was a way to create a huge demographic split in a population in, in terms of health and education, this would be an extremely effective way to do it, right? Mark only a particular portion, conduct enforcement that makes that portion sick and gets their kids out of school, right? And what are we going to see? We're going to see educational differences on life course trajectory differences throughout time. So that was, that was not exactly an answer to your question, but I hope I gave a little bit more about how these impact the next generation. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, thank you, Gupreet. That was some fast Googling. I appreciate it. So that's <laughs> a, a, I'll also share. So we worked on, um, the the raids that I, I, I the, the raid that I originally had discussed was a home raid and and as I mentioned Washington County seven miles away from you all, uh, but we also looked at immigration work site raids that occurred throughout the country, um, so these are much larger in, in scale, um, and since that Postville Iowa raid that we pasted right there. Uh, we kind of stopped this type of enforcement mechanism because it was a humanitarian disaster and politicians tended to stay away from them. But then what we see with the election of President Trump is this humanitarian disaster wasn't something that politicians wanted to avoid in order to appeal to moderates. It was actually really helpful in appealing to the farther right demographic, right? So Trump re-embraced these raids and we see 
uh, at least six that we visited, sites that we visited in 2018. And then again, you, I, I mentioned the raid in Mississippi in 2019. Uh, but using the interviews from folks in all of these sites we had, we, we developed this site to speak to the media um, that just shows some graphic art from each of these locations, as well as some of the public health implications from these, these uh, raids, some of which you heard today. I think we have um, time for one more question, if anyone else has a question. And I want to thank Dr. Lopez um, for your work uh, in this area and for sharing, um, spending some time with us this morning and sharing your work. We really appreciate it. And I think, you know, this translates to many different um, populations kind of around the world in different settings um, and kind of the health outcomes and the lack of trust that that follow these types of raids um, or even as you said kind of these this governmental distrust right these systems and policies that create this distrust all right, I am going to remind everyone while you're maybe thinking of one last question um, that next week we actually have a break from the coffee and conversation speaker series. Um, so enjoy your your long weekend Memorial weekend, and then we'll come back together on June Tuesday, June 7th, and we're going to hear from a colleague from um, Ethiopia Lam Lam Beza, who will be talking about emergency care um, pre hospital and hospital care in Ethiopia. Um, she will be talking a little bit about COVID-19 response as well. And it looks like Dr. Lopez has shared his contact information again in case anybody wants to, to follow up or follow him on Twitter. He's an avid tweeter. <laughs> thanks so much, Michelle. This was great. It was good to see you again. Uh, and thanks, uh, Ika, Heavy, Gupreet, Joko, Lin, uh, Nancy, and everybody else who's joining. It was good to see you all and have a, enjoy the rest of your morning or afternoon or night, wherever your time zone is. So. We'll, we'll stay in touch this time, Michelle. Good to see you all. Definitely. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so yep. much. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.